invite invite those of you that are on to go ahead and familiarize yourself with the chat. Uh, please go ahead and you know say hello and let us know where you're where you're um, logging in from. We'd love to hear from you. For those of you that are watching our recording, uh, please go ahead and uh, follow up with any questions that you might have for with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. And I'll put our email um, out there. You should know it, but it's info at biaia.org. Again, that's info at biaia.org. There are three disclosures or acknowledgements that I would like to make, and those are as follows. Uh, the delivery of this webinar is supported through the Brain Injury Services Program of Iowa through a contract that we hold with the Iowa Department of Public Health. The contents are the, the sole responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official view of the Iowa Department of Public Health. Uh, number two, the content of this presentation is organized by the Brain Injury Alliance, is not intended to be a substitute for me professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions that you, that you may have. And as you may have heard, uh, this session is being recorded uh, to be put on our YouTube channel in the future. With that being said, I would like to welcome you to today's session on cognitive rehabilitation and welcome our speaker, Kristen Kerher, a board certified neuropsychologist and clinical assistant per professor of psychiatry with the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Dr. Kerher is a well respected provider and educator with uh, multiple publications here in Iowa, in addition to a contributing member of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa's board of directors. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Kerher, and please feel free to expand on any points that you have and wish our audience to know. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> and if there are questions that come into the chat, I will do my best to address those right away or we can leave them towards the end. So um, again, I am a board certified neuropsychologist. I work at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Primarily my role is to do assessments, so neuropsychological assessment, um, but I also do some individual cognitive rehabilitation as well as group cognitive rehabilitation. So I'll be speaking a little bit about that today. Oh, okay, add questions there, perfect. Okay, so I, um, probably overprepared here in terms of how many slides I have, but we're going to try to get through everything today. Um, I'll probably talk fast and just do a quick overview for a couple of items, and I could always provide a PDF of these slides um, for folks if that's um, helpful for the things that I sort of skip over pretty quickly. So today I want to go over um, criteria and sequelae or consequences of traumatic brain injury, different types, what other etiologies are there of cognitive impairment, <clears throat> so why might somebody have difficulties with their cognition, and what is cog rehab? A lot of people say will say that word, and there's a lot of different methods, techniques, and types, so we'll kind of go over that for a little bit. Um, we'll also go over out, just brief review of outcomes. There, I can do an entire separate talk on outcomes of cog rehab, because it varies so much in terms of the method and the population that you're working with. So those are those vary very much. Um, so I'll just briefly go over a little bit of that. And then I wanna talk about my intervention, Brain Boosters, which is a group cognitive rehabilitation intervention, as well as what does this actually look like in session? What are some of the compensatory strategies or the ways that we're working around some of the difficulties that folks are having um, in session? So I wanna bring some examples of that as well. I'll close with some referral information, some resources, and of course, you know, you can contact June or myself if you have questions or if I can be helpful in the future. All right, so a lot of this is probably a review, so I won't spend too much time on some of these, um, you know, uh, definitions and terms since you probably already know these, but traumatic brain injury is defined as a traumatically induced structural injury um, or physiological disruption of brain function as a result of an external force and is indicated by one of the following clinical signs immediately following the event. So this is a period of loss of consciousness, decreased level of consciousness or awareness, alteration in mental state, uh, memory uh, loss or disruption of memory for events immediately before and after. So this is referred to as post-traumatic amnesia, 
even though this could could be indicating that someone's having difficulty remembering um, information before the event occurred. Um, so we've got retrograde and enterograde um, post-traumatic amnesia. And then there's, uh, of course, neurological deficits that may be present, such as weakness, loss of balance, changes in vision, hearing, um, numbness, tingling, things like that. This may be transient or this may be persisting depending on the type of injury. There can be a lesion um, within the brain that could be detected on imaging. Uh, there also might, might not be. I'll go into a little bit of this in a moment, but um, this, is, this refers to it being a complicated injury or not. So complicated meaning there are positive neuroimaging findings on an MRI or a CT, and uncomplicated would mean that there's not. This does not mean that the injury is not complicated or disruptive or problematic for the patient or the family. It just, this is the clinical term um, used to kind of help gauge severity and then potential outcome for the brain injury. So these are just some common definitions. Like I said, you've probably uh, heard of all these aware, um, already, but post-traumatic amnesia is the amount of time that somebody might be confused or have, have difficulty demonstrating continuous memory, um, loss of consciousness, sort of self-explanatory, a lack of awareness um, at the time or inability to respond, alteration in consciousness, a little bit more dazed, confused versus actually um, loss of that consciousness. And then a coma is a state of profound unconsciousness. GCS is um, depth of that consciousness and the higher the rating, the more mild the injury. So if somebody scores a 15, that's a pretty mild injury, a three, quite severe. That means they weren't able to respond to much of the stimuli that was presented to them. Uh, duration of loss of consciousness, this is really important. So we look at this as a neuropsychologist or a neurologist. Different providers will ask, how long did you lose consciousness? This is a significant determinant of severity as well as PTA. And then time to follow commands as well. It's important to note if, if medications are, are you know, at place when we're reviewing records, we really want to make sure we're understanding if that loss of consciousness or alteration of consciousness was driven at all by sedating medication to intubate somebody or something like that. Severity of brain injury, it varies depending on the literature that you look at. This is from the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that most psychologists, psychiatric providers will utilize. Um, just looking at mild traumatic brain injury versus moderate and severe. So as you can see, even a loss of consciousness of a half hour would still put you in the mild range. Over a day of loss of consciousness, you're in the more severe range. Um, and then these other indicators as well. I like this one a little bit better because it actually brings in if there's abnormal or normal findings on a CT or MRI. So this can be helpful when determining the severity. Also, it, this isn't a perfect science, right? So somebody might have about you know, less than a half hour of loss of consciousness, but maybe their um, alteration in consciousness or post-traumatic amnesia falls in this range and maybe there is abnormal findings on CT or MRI. So we do our best to gauge severity that helps us predict outcome, but it's not always perfect. It doesn't always fit perfectly within these parameters. So all of you may know some of this already as well, but um, uh, regardless of severity, there can be neurological, cognitive, psychiatric, and emotional and behavioral effects of traumatic brain injury. So in terms of neurological disorders, thinking about um, things like epilepsy, sleep disorders, and even a higher vulnerability for Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia for somebody who's had um, a significant injury or multiple concussions or multiple injuries. Other disease states like a brain tumor, multiple sclerosis, endocrine disorders, and Parkinson's as well, um, uh, these are implicated to be um, more common in this population. Psychiatric disease, um, so the incidence increases across numerous conditions, about 50% develop psychiatric disorder after TBI. Um, there may be some uh, pre-existing psychiatric distress or disorders present before TBI, and then we kind of call it, you know, the volume's getting turned up on some of these symptoms or some of these um, difficulties. Some of the sensory and neurological symptoms include nausea, dizziness, poor vision, um, sensitivity to light and noise, headaches, things like that. Well, one important thing to note is after you know one concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, these symptoms tend to remit uh, pretty quickly after a couple of weeks. There's some literature to support that people may experience symptoms for about a maximum of three months, 
but typically after mild traumatic brain injury con or concussion, those symptoms tend to resolve. In more moderate to severe brain injury, we're looking at those symptoms persisting for quite some time and can be um, somewhat permanent depending on the severity and the location of the injury. In terms of cognitive effects, where, where I pretty much specialize in assessing, the most common are attention and concentration or working memory, holding information in mind, being able to manipulate it and then utilize it. So that's kind of that working memory piece. Learning and, and memory, so learning information, encoding it, and then recalling that information after a delay of time. Your speed of thinking, so how quickly you can process information, and then executive functioning. All, um, all of these other abilities can impact executive functions, which are the higher order thinking skills like um, planning, problem solving, organizing, prioritizing, goal setting, decision making. So all if you think about it, kind of a tiny little executive up there, or maybe not so tiny, but an executive up there working on a lot of those um, higher complex functions. Um, like I said, impairments typically resolve pretty quickly for mild traumatic brain injury. Things get very complicated if somebody's having multiple concussions. That can be seriously a separate talk in itself. Um, but if you know it's only one or two or a few um, things, people tend to do well and recover. And like I said, in more severe injuries, those symptoms can persist. Here are some additional symptoms that people can report and experience confusion, disorientation, so not knowing the day um, or you know, the time of year, problems with attention, distractibility, some visual spatial difficulties, um, communication problems, interpersonal communication, ju poor judgment and insight, awareness. Um, also, it, it should be noted that it, these can depend on the location of the injury. So we kind of talk about in stroke or in brain injury it, and, or tumor, anything that's acutely affecting the brain really location, location, location. If we have a, a part of the brain that's impacted um, very focally, that can lead to different types of cognitive symptoms than somebody who has more of a kind of diffuse pattern. Um, and that's kind of what I'm saying here. So sometimes with emotional behavioral changes, people can experience kind of overactivation, impulsivity, impatience, overreactivity, dysregulation of emotions, anger, agitation. Um, like I said, people may have difficulties with judgment and insight, may not be aware of the difficulties that they're having, which can be really frustrating um, for the patient and for families. Same with social judgment, maybe somebody saying things that <clears throat> they normally never would have said or some socially inappropriate comments. Also challenging for somebody to self-monitor. So if there's physical limitations now, that person may have difficulty remembering to use their walker, use their cane, um, uh, what have you. Depression and anxiety are very common. Adjustment related um, concerns and issues are also very common. There's a sense of loss. If there has been a change in somebody's life, maybe grief, failure, or a change in that ability to fulfill their dreams, depending again on the severity and what's going on with the injury. Confidence, self-esteem issues, um, again, that pre-existing psychiatric history can be a risk factor for increased psychiatric and behavioral problems post-injury. Um, there can be substance use to um, maladaptively cope with some of these changes that can honestly really just put someone further at risk for further neurological injury. Um, and some of these emotional behavioral challenges tend to be the, the, the higher reported challenge for, for families. In addition to brain injury, I work with lots of different conditions that can cause cognitive impairment. So um, stroke is another type of brain injury, but you know, a bleed to the brain or um, an infarct. Medical conditions, so people who have complex medical conditions have problems with cognitions at times. Um, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, neurodegenerative conditions. I work with primarily this population in rehabilitation. Um, thyroid dysfunction, endocrine problems, tumor, systemic cancer, Mood absolutely can on its own affect cognition. Stress, good or bad. So if you're getting married or moving and this is good, that can still get in the way of sometimes paying good attention, processing information efficiently, um, or bad stress, of course, or negative stress in your life. Pain, um, and of course, sleep difficulties. So on neuropsychological assessment, in our evaluations, we have a unique cognitive profile that's, that's demonstrated. So we can identify cognitive and behavioral symptoms um, 
uh, that, that are happening for the patient and the family, assist with differential diagnosis, and what might be driving some of these difficulties for this particular person or patient. We can help with treatment planning. Um, we might be facilitating lots of different referrals if not already completed. Um, and, we, and we are providing unique and tailored recommendations so that the patient and family can have an optimal quality of life. So those with cognitive impairment, this has a pretty profound negative impact, not only for the individual who has the diagnosis and the condition, but also for their families, caregivers, and public health services. Um, typically, better functional ability is associated with a higher quality of life and higher quality of life for the caregiver as well. So cognitive rehabilitation and improved brain health could be a valuable component of support for people with cognitive difficulties and for their families. So when we say what is cognitive rehabilitation, um, basically it's complicated. There are a lot of different types. Like I mentioned, um, it really depends on the population that you're working with. It also depends on the type of intervention that you're talking about. So the historical model of rehabilitation kind of um, worked with those with more acute injuries. So things like traumatic brain injury, stroke, tumor resection, things like that. Um, it sort of shifted to move towards other types of conditions, such as neurodegenerative types. Um, those are the folks that I generally work with, with mild cognitive impairment, um, dementias, different things like that. Typically, the interventions are best suited for those who are well motivated, who are generally pretty functional, who are independent and more mild to moderate cognitive impairments. Those who are entering into the severe level of impairment might have a hard time latching on to some of the strategies and um, have a hard time with carryover of those strategies as well. However, sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis, this can still be really helpful um, because family may attend those rehabil rehabilitation sessions and may, able to, may be able to um, implement those interventions. Uh, in terms of outcomes, like I said, it's mixed because a lot of the interventions are mixed and a lot of the language is used kind of interchangeably. So there's two basic types of rehabilitation. One is restorative. This is aimed at reinforcing, strengthening, or restoring impaired skills. This is not usually the type of rehabilitation that I would engage in, especially because, I'm, again, I'm working more with neurodegenerative conditions that are getting worse by definition over time. So we're not really thinking that we're going to restore somebody's functions in dementia or mild cognitive impairment, but we might certainly help them function better on a day-to-day -day basis. However, somebody who's had a stroke, uh, you know, a tumor resection or a traumatic brain injury, it may be possible that we might be restoring impaired skills by finding ways to work around those difficulties. So it's not that that maybe the tissue that's not alive anymore is restored, but maybe there's a different pathway might take a little bit longer for that person to engage and do that skill, but um, there might be new neural networks being formed. Um, so we do see some evidence of that in those more acute injuries and processes versus something more neurodegenerative. The type of work that I typically work, work in is compensatory type of work with rehab. So teaching ways of bypassing or working around the impaired function or the difficulty that the person's having. So examples of this is using assistive technology, setting reminders, using calendars, memory devices. Um, you know, I'll go through some, some other examples later in this talk of some um, strategies that I'll go over with people. Also, medication management has been found to be helpful. Um, now, this is not only to potentially slow the progression of a degenerative condition, as well as sometimes methylphenidate. This is a stimulant medication can be used for folks who've had a stroke, tumor, or a brain injury to, um, to kind of help with, with energy engagement um, and attention. So there's three types of rehab. This is stimulation, training, and rehabilitation. So cognitive stimulation is defined as engagement in a range of activities and discussions. This is usually done in a group aimed at general enhancement of cognitive and social functioning. Cognitive training is really more specific. It's guided practice on a set of standard tasks designed to um, reflect particular cognitive functions. So this is usually done on an individual basis, and this may be truly to improve a specific skill after an injury as somebody is, is, is recovering from a neurological event. Cognitive rehab is an individualized approach where personally relevant goals are identified and the therapist works with the person and his or her family to, to really develop these strategies and to address this on a personal basis. 
Um, in dementia care, this helps patients in the early stages to maintain their memory and higher cognitive functions and compensate for declining functions. So like I mentioned, really the idea is improving performance in everyday life rather than on cognitive tests. The literature really doesn't support that we're going to see a change in um, cognitive abilities from point one to point two after some of these cognitive rehabilitation strategies. However, somebody may be doing better on a functional basis day to day in their environment and the family may notice this as well. So the idea is building on the person's strengths, developing ways of compensating for the person's impaired functions. So um, like I said, uh, rehab was initially developed for those with brain injury, later was adapted to those with more declining types of degenerative um, conditions. Um, there's other interventions that are specifically targeted at other populations, such as systemic cancer or um, focal tumor, MS. Idea, the idea here is interventions that are targeted to assist with managing everyday activities, functioning most optimally. We want people to maintain as much independence as possible, but while still balancing that safety as well, um, and addressing the impact of impairments on daily life and activities. Um, this is not only helpful for the individual, but also the family's quality of life. So a lot of, depend, again, depending on the severity, you likely want to involve the family in this type of work. All right, I already talked about this a little bit, but yet when you're working with somebody um, on, on cognitive rehabilitation, you really want to work with that individual or family to identify the goals that that person would like to achieve and the family would like to achieve. This is going to look very different for different conditions, different people, different families, depending on the context, resources, different things like that. Cognitive rehabilitation can be done in a, in a variety of settings. This can be done in a person's home. One thing that's been kind of a silver lining of this pandemic is being able to do telehealth, cognitive rehabilitation, and working with individuals within their home. So not actually having to go into the home, but doing kind of in vivo coaching and training, helping people to, you know, who, I had a patient the other week who wanted to kind of make a list of things that she needed to get done around the house and wanted to do at least a couple of them. Well, we sat down right in session and we made that list and we prioritized what's urgent, what's not, what takes priority and what should we get started with and let's get started with it in session. So that's kind of been nice to be able to enter into someone's home in that way via telehealth. Of course, we have people who come into the office to do this and in the group setting. Format can be individual or group. This can be done with the individual or caregivers. Again, depending on the condition and severity, it can be nice to involve the family if possible. So specific skills after you're kind of developing these specific goals, um, procedural learning can be utilized, reactivating previous knowledge, so tying to previous skills and um, information that the person already knows, learning how to compensate for their known difficulties and challenges, providing reminders if insight is impaired of the difficulties that they're having. Sometimes this looks like putting signs on the door, no, do not leave without mom or without, you know, partner, whoever it might be. Um, sometimes there's specific traumatic brain injury concerns that need to be um, addressed or dementia concerns. Uh, enhanced learning, there, we won't get into details with this, but there um, is modeling, prompting involved. So um, showing somebody how to do something, having them do it with you or showing you that they understand what you're saying in session. Um, expanding rehearsal of information. So with memory, we're always talking about repetition, repetition, repetition and rehearsal. That can help us to consolidate that information and be able to recall it a little bit easier. Um, also breaking down activities into small steps and parts, even doing the laundry can be really daunting for somebody. So even just maybe sorting the clothes into you know, colors and whites or starting with something, something very simple and having somebody successfully do that before we gradually increase the difficulty. Um, within rehab as well, we're using compensatory strategies, memory aids, there may be support for depression and anxiety, as well as adjustment related concerns. This can affect somebody's identity or their mood if they've just had an injury or if their cognition's declining. Um, if they're not able to do something they used to be able to do, that's very challenging from a psychological perspective to, to adapt to. It's really important as the therapist to be very flexible because goals can shift and goals can change. What somebody thinks they want to start working on, they may want to shift that. Or you may see as the therapist, 
oh, actually, I know you had said that this is a primary area of difficulty, but I'm noticing that this seems to be very challenging for you. What do you think about us trying to address this? So making sure that you're being flexible about your approach. These are some common neuropsychological recommendations that we'll utilize in reports. So sometimes um, go into a rehabilitation uh, facility um, to have physical, occupational, and speech therapy is really important. Um, increased supervision, monitoring, and assistance. Uh, this may be, may be helpful and necessary, especially after initial discharge from a facility. Um, there might, we might need to wait to return to work, wait to return to drive. Um, there might need to be a follow-up driving evaluation or a follow-up neuropsychological evaluation before returning to some of these activities. We may need to restrict access to firearms, power tools, or potentially dangerous equipment. Um, mood can, like I said, common, um, you know, common comorbidities. So look, making sure to be monitoring mood if it's not a problem, um, treating mood if it is, um, maintaining structure and routine, um, and making sure that the person is not being overwhelmed or overstimulated. So giving that person enough time for rest and um, cognitive recovery. So some other types of treatment, like I mentioned, speech therapy, PT, OT, this is usually vital after an acute injury. Um, it's usually, cog rehab is not usually done in a standalone treatment. This is usually done within a multidisciplinary context. Um, medical follow-up is usually very important. Um, and then psychiatric care, whether that be medication management and or psychotherapy. So um, sometimes learning how to reintegrate into social activities can be a primary focus for somebody in psychotherapy. How do I work on my interpersonal communication? How do I pay attention in conversation? This is hard for me. This is some of the things that we've talked about with patients. Um, some other things for specifically for traumatic brain injury. So there are some subacute and acute rehabilitation that is holistic in nature. There's a couple of really great programs across the country that helps people to kind of uh, relearn social skill training, has that physical, cognitive, and emotional support. Medication can be helpful. Um, usually neurologists and psychiatrists are pretty skilled in, in, in knowing what medications can be helpful for what conditions. And of course, it really is important to be looking at what that person's already taking and what potential contraindications or um, interactions those medications may have. Um, I do not prescribe any medications. I have some familiarity with them, but that's definitely something that um, you'd want to follow up with medical providers regarding. Um, let's see here. There's also um, lots of studies to demonstrate the utility of specific rehab approaches, like I've mentioned. Some of that retraining specifically looks at attention retraining, executive functioning skills, um, and a lot of future research is needed to really see how some of these skills can generalize into daily functioning. That's a, a, a primary interest of mine. Um, and then training in the use of supported devices, either, um, you know, a memory book, sometimes people need visual reminders throughout the home. So there's lots of different, you know, creative things that, that people um, can utilize, both with therapists or um, their rehab team on inpatient before discharge. So again, just going to go into this really briefly here. Um, in terms of rehabilitation outcome, Brain boosters initially had started when I was on my residency at the Phoenix VA. So they actually did a study to look at the feasibility and the effectiveness of this intervention. I'll talk a little bit more about brain boosters in a moment, but this is gen in general, this is a psychoeducation and cognitive enhancement stimulation group. Um, at this time, they were doing 10 weekly sessions and they were utilizing this among a veteran population. So what they found is younger veterans reported a reduction in memory impairment from pre-treatment to post-treatment. So they were seeing less trouble with their memory after the group and fewer attentional difficulties and fewer depressive symptoms um, after the group with veterans across all ages. And there was another study conducted in 2012 that, that concluded that there was a reduction of post-traumatic stress symptoms and depressive symptoms following intervention. So my hypothesis in doing this group is that quality of life may improve, people may become more functional in their day-to-day -day activities, and they may see reduction in mood symptoms following the group as well. Um, in general, like I mentioned earlier, studies are pretty limited by a lack of standardization techniques. Someone calling something training versus rehab versus stimulation, so there's mixed evidence. 
there's been pretty consistent evidence to suggest that stimulation and individual rehab programs do benefit cognition pretty significantly, but there are variable quality of some of those studies, so further research just continues to be indicated. Cognitive training is less supported, um, especially with randomized controlled trials, um, but it will be critical for all of these types of rehabilitation um, interventions to demonstrate that these improvements actually extend outside of session and into real life activities. That's really the point here, right? Is we wanna make sure that this is effective and helpful for somebody in their, in their daily life. Uh, talked about this a little bit. This is more so for dementia, some of the medications that can be helpful. Um, as well as lifestyle factors. So in Brain Boosters, I talk about nutrition, we talk about diet, exercise, cerebral perfusion, getting you know increased blood flow to the brain, making sure that we're staying healthy from a holistic standpoint, lowering general systemic inflammation, um, and different lifestyle factors like that. So I've talked about Brain Boosters a few times, kind of what is it? What are these compensatory strategies? What do these look like? So this was a psychoeducational and cognitive enhancement group that was started at the Phoenix VA healthcare system. Um, basically, uh, you're able to have an adult um, patient or client come to the group and a caregiver is allowed to come as well. Um, this group I really enjoyed administering and being a part of while I was um, on my residency and I really didn't have a chance to utilize this until I got here to the University of Iowa in 2016. So I asked them, is this something that I could do? And they said, as long as you give us credit where the group was originally um, created, absolutely go for it. So I adapted the group to a more general population, not just a veteran population, and changed some of the content, um, reduced the group from 10 weeks to eight weeks, and um, have been doing the group since 2017 here. We do the group over Zoom. Um, that, you know, it's definitely certainly fine. It's, I think we, we have found that it's better in person to do it. So we're doing it here at UIHC with masks and distanced. Um, and then I'm doing some individual cognitive rehabilitation as well. So within this group, um, I'll just go to the, you know, the um, layout here of what we do. There's an introduction and overview and general education of what we provide. Um, we also talk about general health, stress management. This is this is what I was talking about earlier with diet, exercise, lowering inflammation, um, and really looking at relaxation strategies to, to help with cognition as well. Sleep hygiene, um, we're looking at sleep behaviors and how to improve sleep. This is a common complaint with people who have cognitive problems. Um, neuroanatomy, this is a fancy word of how the brain is organized and structured. And a lot of times after somebody's had an event to the brain or even a neurodegenerative process that, that affects a certain part of the brain, they may, not, they may have been told something's happening to the left temporal lobe, but they don't really know what that does and what that means functionally for them. So we go over some common conditions and areas of the brain that can be impacted and what you might see if something like that were to happen. Um, in that lecture, we also talk about language, word finding problems, which is a very common complaint as well. Session five, we discuss attention, pain management, and how that can impact cognition and vice versa. Uh, we discuss memory, learning, and strategies as well, executive functioning. Um, and then the last session is uh, pretty busy, but we talk about emotions, personality, um, interpersonal communication, and then wrap up and review a lot of what we had done in the prior, prior weeks. So like I mentioned, this group is currently running through UIHC. I would previously partnered with um, a retirement community, and I'm hoping to continue to develop partnerships as this pandemic improves. So a lot of what we do in Brain Boosters is pretty consistent with what other large organizations are doing. So the Global Council for Brain Health talks about that we want people to, you know, in order to have better mental well-being and to boost our brains, um, we want to get out there and be moving. Uh, we want to be, you know, out there learning, being grateful, discovering, relaxing, finding time to breathe deeply, decluttering, getting good sleep, connecting, having that socialization, building friendships and then nourishing, making sure that we're cutting back on the you know, toxic substances we're putting into our bodies and eating healthy foods and trying to nourish our body. Harvard Health um, also has a cognitive fitness course um, and a lot of the same topics that they are covering, I cover in Brain Boosters. Same with the World Health Organization and the CDC. Um, they're talking about different preventative strategies for dementia, 
a lot of the uh, a lot of these topics here we're talking about in brain boosters as well. So I'll go over this really quickly because this may not be of, of, of complete interest to some of you, but this, I do look at some different measures when I'm get, when I'm um, uh, doing brain boosters. So some of the clinical outcome measures, we're looking at the quality of life and neurological disorders. This is called the NeuroQual. The specific scales I'm looking at um, are aspects of fatigue and sleep problems, anxiety, depression, um, cognitive functioning, communication, um, behavioral discontrol, and how well is somebody to be um, how well is somebody able to participate in their um, social activities and relationships? And we're also looking at insight, caregiver strain, and demographic information to try to understand who does brain boosters best serve, who's benefiting the most. We haven't done quali quantitative analysis, but I've done lots of qualitative analysis. I'll go over this pretty quickly. So just looking at what people are saying, what do they like about brain boosters? Practical information, relaxed environment, patients, understanding, group interaction, um, lots of support from the group, helpful overall, knowledgeable and engaging, learning what might come next in my Parkinson's journey, improving memory and other functioning, things like that. Well, have you noticed changes in your cognition, recognizing behaviors I hadn't seen as a problem before, concentration has improved, more aware, better at completing my daily tasks, thinking a little clearer. Um, mood has improved. Home is a little lighter, well planned, organized, um, excellent group. Let's see. So, just those are just a few things that people have said. In terms of compensatory strategies and cognitive exercises and brain boosters, we, like I said before, we're learning ways to work around and compensate for the areas of difficulty. People might have problems with word finding, comprehension learning and memory, attention and processing speed, executive functioning. This could be due to something like a dementia, or I've had plenty of people come to the group who've had a uh, prior brain injury. Um, same with those who've had a prior stroke, or people who have had mood difficulties who would like to come to the group. So lots of different people with different conditions are coming to the group. We discuss internal and self-management strategies, so what that person or couple can do on their own, as well as environmental modifications. So what can we do in the environment to help with this? So here's just a few examples. Um, with regards to attention and executive functioning and memory, one thing is we can write everything down, right? So this is something, some of these are not, you know, um, super complex, but something that people may have not thought about. Staying as present as possible, especially in conversation, sometimes repeating yourself. I need to focus on the conversation at hand right now. Recording information in the future. The act of writing something down can help us process that information more deeply. Making to-do lists, doing one thing at a time. One thing I always tell our participants or people I work with individually is multitasking is, is great if you're able to do it, but if you're having trouble with completing multiple things, it's probably best not to do those multiple things at one time. We should focus on one task at a time and even break down that task into small, more manage manageable steps. Um, and honestly, sometimes it's about having some acceptance that take a task that used to take you an hour or even five minutes might now take you an hour and then that's okay. And so some acceptance for the condition and the slower speed to get something done. It can be really nice to make a list and to cross things off after you complete it. I know myself that that's something that I absolutely love to do, to write something down and to cross that puppy off when I'm done with it. Um, sometimes we try to keep it all online mentally and it can lead to a lot of worry, things are falling off, we forgot about that. So writing things down can be really helpful. In conversation, making eye contact, um, sometimes repeating back in the conversation, not only to ensure understanding, but also to let the listener know that you're engaged. Um, it also can help you remember that person's name. Um, sometimes it can be good to alternate tasks and subjects based on your level of interest. So, you know, what, maybe you used to be able to concentrate for a couple of hours on something, and we need to actually break that up a little bit um, and do something different after you've approached the taxes or paying bills for 20 minutes or something like that. Focus and refocus attention. So you may need to self-talk or may need to have a caregiver help you with that. It's okay, stay focused. Do we need to take a break? Let's go back to that later. Um, have others make sure that you're paying attention when speaking to you. 
this happens all the time, right? Somebody might be on their phone or they might be in another room. They might not be looking at you. So trying to have that person stay as engaged as possible and try to have them repeat back the information that you shared with them to, to ensure that they're paying attention and have an understanding. Like we talked about breaking tasks down into smaller parts and managing fatigue. This is especially important for acute neurological conditions. Somebody who's recovering from a neurological event can become very overwhelmed um, with, with daily tasks. So we really wanna check in about level of fatigue, how overwhelmed somebody's feeling and really kind of gauge their daily routine based on that. I won't go through all of these. I know this can kind of be a lot, but these are just to give you an example of some of the things we talk about in Brain Boosters. Modifying your environment. So putting keys, wallet in the same place every day. Doing important tasks at a time of the day that you're at your best. Some people will say they're morning people. Other people are more nighttime people. Kind of knowing what kind of person you are and when you best operate and are most um, you know, functional is good. Writing everything down and reducing distractions, making lists. Sometimes this is, I work with people individual, individually and we have multiple lists. So we have a medication list. We might have a morning routine list. We have a nighttime routine list. Some of these are laminated, placed on uh, different you know, core places within the person's home. Maybe the medication pillbox needs to go right next to the coffee pot. I've had patients say, I might forget my medications, but I'm not going to forget my coffee. So putting things next to, um, you know, a familiar place or somewhere that you likely won't forget can be really helpful. Making signs. I worked with people on this as well. So stop, check to see if you have your keys, cell phone, wallet, or I have a, I have a patient who tends to wander. So we have a, a sign at multiple places in their apartment to not leave without somebody um, accompanying that person, and those reminders have worked. One other thing that can be helpful is keeping your environment organized. So if we have lots of different post-its around the house with different things to do, it's hard to know sometimes which one did I already do, which one do I still need to pay attention to and remember. So after you're done with that, post-it note, maybe take it down and, and toss it, or if you have one consolidated place that I would recommend you do have, um, whether that be on an electronic device or a paper calendar or planner, have your list there and then cross things off as you do it. We talked about this a little bit as well, utilizing technology to make your life easier. If you're not super tech savvy, maybe you can have somebody help you who is and set up some reminders for you. That way you won't have to worry about it. Um, these are some, uh, some memory strategies that can be helpful. Uh, there's a matching card game and different brain health activities that I included here. And then these are some word finding strategies. Word finding problems are very nonspecific, meaning they can come from a variety of causes. Somebody who just had a baby might have word finding, finding problems. Somebody who has dementia might, somebody with a brain injury might. So it, it, it's nonspecific, but either way, it's a common problem. And these are some different strategies that can be helpful with finding and generating those words, giving it some time. The word may come on its own. Describe what the item is or what it's about. Thinking of a similar word. One of my favorites is scanning the alphabet. This can be really effective and helpful to do. So this is a visual attention exercise. Um, I will need a couple of people to unmute themselves. Um, this probably this might be pretty easy for you guys, but if you can if you can just call out some of the differences that you see in these pictures, this is just an example of something, um, some different visual activities that I go through in Brain Boosters. Is that a light or something in the bottom left corner? Yep, good. The monkey on the back there? Yes. If that's a monkey. Yes. <laughs> Everyone always says that. They're like some sort of animal. Yes, monkey. Yeah. The moon in one and not in the other. Yep. Very good. Uh, and, uh, one ha the left one has an extra engine. Yep. Very good. And there's just one more. I see it, but I'll let somebody else go. <laughs> the wing on the top has got the middle line versus. Yeah, yeah, very good. 
Awesome. So you got all of them. Very good. So we do we do a variety of these to kind of help with that visual attention and discrimination. This is another um, activity that we do. This is a deductive reasoning puzzle. So every every session in Brain Boosters, we not only have education to um, inform people about you know different aspects of diet, exercise, sleep, cognition, whatever it might be, but then we do activities, experiential activities that are related. This task is not only important for working memory, attention, problem solving, reasoning. Um, so it's a it's an important one. We won't go through this together, but. I like to tell people to go in in sequential order to answer uh, to, to fill out this box and complete it. Um, it can be a fun activity to do together as a group. So um, people people typically enjoy that one. And then we do Sudoku together as well. And I provide um, paper handouts of Sudoku as well. Lots of different cognitive skills utilized in Sudoku as well. So um, in, in summary, lots of different types of cognitive rehabilitation and definitions widely vary in the literature, which again, translates to varied outcomes, not the best evidence of um, positive effects on cognition, mood or quality of life with training, um, but you know, this needs further investigation for sure. Um, seems to be the most improvement with cognitive stimulation and individual cognitive rehabilitation. So if anyone's interested in brain boosters or individual cognitive rehabilitation, um, feel free to reach out to me. We also have um, the Department of Neurology that does this service as well here. Um, and I'm sure that there's other providers in the community as well. So thank you. And I can't believe I finished that in time. And I am open to questions, which I actually see that there's one here. Uh, our brains are functioning today. Okay, good, good, I love that. So um, just, if anyone has other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. So Kristen, this is June. I actually do have a question. Um, in yeah. the services that you've been delivering, are you, and maybe you're not, but are you seeing any um, impacts related to individuals that have had COVID? Um, whether that be, um, you know, the PASC, the, the long COVID, or um, just in recovery in general, uh, are you seeing differences in the delivery of your services or the Brain Boosters program? We haven't gotten a lot of referrals for <clears throat> um, in Brain Boosters or individual cognitive rehabilitation um, for individuals who've had COVID um, or some of these long haul symptoms. Certainly, we've seen these individuals for neuropsychological assessment. And, um, and we're definitely seeing that there's um, a variety of different symptoms that these folks are experiencing, cognitive, uh, some neurological symptoms, some vascular symptoms. Um, and in the, primarily the people that we've seen here who've come to clinic here, again, this is just my experience, but <clears throat> they've generally been high functioning people prior to COVID. And they're, they're really noticing this drop or this this change or decline in functioning or cognition um, since since having COVID and these long long standing symptoms. So, uh, and I I would anticipate that this is only going to increase in terms of the referrals that we'll get for assessment. And I would imagine that we might start to get referrals for brain boosters for this specific population. I do know that we have an, we have a specific COVID clinic here that has uh, that's multidisciplinary. So it has neurology, cardiology, pulmonology, tons of different services, and they do refer over to us for neuropsychology. Um, but they were actually thinking of creating a support group or a type of psychological intervention for these individuals. And I do not know where the hospital stands with that, but. I, um, I, I do think that for cognitive specific concerns related to that, if I got enough referrals, we could even do a, a COVID specific group, because like I mentioned, some of those referrals so far for neuros that have been higher functioning people. I appreciate that. I, I would welcome uh, our organizations kind of connecting on that as well, if we can be supportive. I know that we've been uh, providing just information and also opportunity for a monthly support group uh, specifically related to COVID. Uh, so as you hear more about that, please, please let us know. I think that that yeah. would be good to be aware of. You mentioned earlier that that you've been doing brains, brain boosters virtually. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that will continue in terms of being able to make referrals or, you know, people that might be in other 
parts of the state of Iowa that we would be able to refer folks yes. to brain boosters? Yes, great question. And yes, it will continue. Like I said, I, I think ideally it's great to do this group in person, um, but another silver lining of this pandemic has been the telehealth of of reaching people who live far away and wouldn't be able to come to the university. Um, so absolutely, I plan to continue the group via telehealth. I think the hybrid option is another thing that we're kind of looking at where maybe some will be in person if they can be, and some will be um, telehealth and um, over Zoom. So, so yes, to answer your question, we'll definitely be continuing that. Great, thank you. And I do see that Allie, um popped a, a link into the chat okay. for those of you that are on related to our support groups and 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 Dr. Kerr, please feel free to grab that as well for your resources. Yes. Um, sure. Any any other questions from the group, please feel free to come off mute and ask your question and or uh, put it in the chat for us to add. Well, and I can probably stop sharing. I will say I have lots of um, references here for anyone who wants to do a ton of reading but um oops i want to stop my share okay there we, there go. we go great Sorry. i you know for for my age i should be better with technology but here we are so <laughs> <laughs> two years two in, in and we're still <laughs> exactly here we are um so, and if we, if we could get a copy of the the powerpoint we're happy to share that as well um if folks have questions about that. And I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So I can certainly do a closing and unless you have any additional information you want to share. Nope, I'm happy to send along, you know, like I said, a PDF of the slides if you'd like, just let me know. And thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and close out here for folks. Um, thank you again, Dr. Kerher, for, for joining us today and, and doing this session. I, I think it's going to be incredibly useful uh, for our staff to be able to share. And um, I'm guessing we'll get lots of views on YouTube. Uh, so it has, it, it's just been incredibly insightful. And I'll in, invite um, those of you in attendance live to consider our next session. Um, we're going to be holding another session tomorrow at noon titled uh, Note to Self, It's Okay to Set Boundaries. Um, I'm excited about that session as well. That will be presented by Courtney Sand. Um, and for any of our recorded presentations, uh, we do encourage folks to uh, check out our social media as well as um, as well as our social, I'm sorry, social media pages, as well as our uh, YouTube page. I'm trying to do two things at once here uh, to check out uh, previously recorded information. I am dropping here in the chat a feedback link. Uh, we do ask for feedback. It's something that we have to report out on um, related to the events that we hold. So we, and of course we want to be continuously uh, improving our sessions and the content that we're able to offer you. So I'm not seeing any additional questions or comments. I just encourage folks to grab those links that are in there. And other than that, I wish you all a great day and hope to see you tomorrow on uh, Courtney Sands uh, Boundary Session. Thanks again, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Take care.